Just a few weeks ago, we covered Zodiac, the 2007 film by David Fincher that tells the story of the Zodiac Killer. Three years after Zodiac was released, Fincher released another movie that was based on a true story. This time, Fincher teamed up with writer Aaron Sorkin, the creator of multiple TV series including Sports Night, The West Wing, and The Newsroom. Fincher's The Social Network was released in 2010 and tells the story behind one of the most popular websites in the world, Facebook.com. The film was relatively low budget, costing $40 million, and made more than half of that on opening weekend on its way to $225 million at the box office. Needless to say, the movie was a hit as people around the world went to see the story behind the website used by over 1.65 billion users per month as of April 2016. For all those who went to see The Social Network, the one person who said he wouldn't see it was the one you might have thought would be the first in line at the premiere, Mark Zuckerberg. After the movie was released, there was a bit of controversy between many of the people portrayed in the movie. Facebook's founder would have this to say about the movie, quote, They went out of their way in the movie to try to get some interesting details correct, like the design of the office, but on the overarching plot, they just kind of made up a bunch of stuff that I found kind of hurtful, end quote. Cameron Winklevoss, who's portrayed in the film as a Harvard student who claimed Mark Zuckerberg stole the idea from him, said, quote, It does a great job of capturing factual events of the 18 months of the founding of Facebook. It is a true story, end quote. But the film's writer, Aaron Sorkin, said, quote, I don't want my fidelity to be in the truth. I want it to be storytelling, end quote. So what is the truth behind the social network? I'm Dan LeFebvre, and this is based on a true story. Mark Zuckerberg was born on May 14, 1983 in White Plains, New York, to a fairly well-off family. His father ran his own dental practice and his mother was a psychiatrist. Mark was the only boy in a family of four children. At 12, Mark wrote his first computer program on an Atari using BASIC to develop something he nicknamed ZuckNet. It was a messenger program that his dad used in his dental office, which was attached to the family's home, so the receptionist could let him know when a new patient came in without having to yell across the room. Mark later went to Phillips Exeter Academy, a prep school in New Hampshire. His love for computers never died, and in 2002, while he was at Exeter, he teamed up with Adam D'Angelo, who would later go on to start the huge Q&A website Quora, to build a WinApp plugin that they called Synapse. If you're not familiar with Winamp, it was one of the world's most popular music players on Windows at the time. Synamps basically worked like Pandora does, learning what songs you want to listen to next. You can actually still find the Synapse website out there on the Internet Archives. Underneath Mark Zuckerberg's name, the bio he no doubt gave himself says, quote, developer guy, team leader, graphic skills, with a Z, webmaster flex, anti aliases by hand, likes Chinese girls, programmer god, the nerd. If you hit it and that thing feels deeper, say his name, end quote. I kid you not. Remember, Mark was 18 at the time. Despite this glowing bio on the site, the software was solid. AOL and Microsoft wanted to buy the software from Mark and Adam, and although there's never been any official documentation, the internet has plenty of rumors floating around that the developer duo was offered up to $2 million for their little program, which they turned down. It seems neither Mark or Adam really needed the money. Interestingly, AOL had just bought Nolsolf, the developers of Winamp, for about $80 million in 1999. They'd end up selling Nolsolf in 2014 for about $10 million. We can only wonder what would have happened if Mark and Adam were involved in Winamp's development. Mark graduated from Exeter in 2002 and went to Harvard. And that's where the social network kicks off in October of 2003. Mark, who's played by Jesse Eisenberg, is talking with Erica Albright, who's played by Rooney Mara. Their discussion quickly turns negative when Erica breaks up with Mark, making it clear that she's doing it because he's, quote, an a**, end quote. After this nasty breakup, Mark returns to his dorm at Harvard, where he starts building something. It's a website named FaceMash, which essentially allows a user to rate girls. 
the key here is that they were all girls from Harvard, and Mark hacked into internal sites around Harvard to get the photos. It wasn't a complicated hack, but a hack nonetheless. There was definitely some Hollywood license here. One of the key differences, and it's one that you'll notice throughout the entire movie, is that Mark Zuckerberg isn't really an a- That's not to say he's never been called one, only he knows that, but author David Kirkpatrick, who has interviewed Mark Zuckerberg numerous times for his book, The Facebook Effect, the inside story of the company that is connecting the world, said this of Mark's portrayal in the movie. Quote, Jesse Eisenberg plays Zuckerberg as an angry, insecure, but cocky young jerk whose creation of the service initially called the Facebook was motivated in large part by a desire to win the attention of his former girlfriend. In fact, Zuckerberg is one of the least angry people I've ever met. He is even-tempered, generally upbeat, if prone to silence, and highly self-confident." End quote. The part that did happen, though, is that Mark developed a site called FaceMash that randomly displayed two student photos and let users vote on which one was more attractive. And yes, he did so while he was blogging the experience, with one of his posts saying, quote, I need to think of something to make to take my mind off her, end quote. Originally, Face Mash was going to compare classmates to farm animals, asking which was more attractive, but one of his roommates suggested, instead, to only compare classmates. In the movie, when the site goes live, Harvard's network comes crashing down. This was exaggerated for the movie. In truth, what happened was about four hours after the site was launched, Harvard's network administrators noticed a spike in traffic and shut off Mark's internet access. So the network did go down, but just for Mark's dorm room. In those four hours, about 450 students hit the site and logged 22,000 votes. Harvard ended up shutting down the entire site because they rightfully thought it was inappropriate. Still, it was because of FaceMash and another program Mark created called Course Match that drew the attention of Divya Narendra and Cameron and Tyler Winklevoss. All three were other Harvard students. In the movie, Divya is played by Max Minghella and the Winklevoss twins were played by Army Hammer. Yes, Army Hammer played both Cameron and Tyler. Well, sort of. Josh Pence played Tyler on set, but a face replacement of another army happened in post-production to finish the twin effect. In the movie, there's a scene where Divya and the Winklevoss twins offer Mark a sandwich while they lay out their idea for a site called Harvard Connection. Mark agrees to help as he stuffs the sandwich in his bag. This happened, although we don't know the fate of the sandwich. Just like in the movie, the three Harvard students approached Mark to see if he'd be interested in working on Harvard Connection. The idea behind the site was to essentially be a dating site for Harvard students, more specifically the wealthier of the students. In the movie, there's a lot of time that passes as the Winklevoss twins and Divya keep getting postponed by Mark. The movie makes it seem like Mark is working on Facebook instead of the Harvard Connection, Well, a lot of this history is only known by those four people, and it boils down to one person's word against the other. As best as we can tell, this didn't really happen. Although Mark did agree that he would work on Harvard Connection, he soon lost interest and dropped off the project. While the Winklevoss twins no doubt offered to pay Mark for his work on Harvard Connection, Mark wasn't motivated by money. If he was, he would have sold Synapse for millions while he was still in high school. Instead, Mark wanted to work on a project that some of his friends were working on. These friends were Dustin Miskovitz, played by Joseph Mazzello, Chris Hughes, played by Patrick Maple, and Eduardo Saverin, played by the future Spider-Man Andrew Garfield. In the movie, it's Andrew Garfield's character, Eduardo Saverin, who finances the site. As the movie progresses, Eduardo's friendship with Mark turns sour as he feels, and rightly so, according to the movie, that... Mark has cheated him out of a huge portion of stock. Again, we'll probably never know what actually happened since a lot of this boils down to Eduardo's word against Mark's word, but as best as we can tell, this is fictionalized by the movie to help create bigger tensions in the film. But they did get a few facts right along the way, helping make it seem more believable. One of the facts they got right was that Eduardo helped fund the site, but so did Mark. Eduardo did start with a $1,000 investment, then Mark also put in $1,000 of his own. As they needed more equipment, both Eduardo and Mark put in $10,000 each. 
In the movie, there's a scene where Mark is watching a hackathon where it appears that he's vetting potential new employees by their abilities. Eduardo hands Mark an envelope and explains he set up a bank account. This part happened, uh, the bank account at least. It was toward the end of 2003, and Eduardo set up a new bank account with 15000 of his own dollars in there. Both Eduardo and Mark had access to the account. Why, Eduardo? It's most likely that Mark simply didn't care about the money, but he knew that he'd need it. And Eduardo, on the other hand, put off the impression that he knew a lot about business. So it's likely that Mark thought Eduardo would be able to handle the business side, leaving Mark with the technical side, the side that he loved. We get this sort of insight from an instant messenger conversation that has since surfaced on the website businessinsider.com. This conversation took place between Mark and one of his friends on January 8th, 2004. Mark, Eduardo is paying for my servers. Friend, a sucker born every day. Mark, nah, he thinks it will make money. Friend, what do you think? Mark, well, I don't know business stuff. I'm content to make something cool. On January 11th, 2004, Mark registered the domain name thefacebook.com. Shortly after, he mentioned in an article for the Crimson Magazine and internal Harvard Magazine that he was inspired by FaceMash to take things to the next level. He knew the technology was there, and he knew Harvard wouldn't be creating something like this anytime soon. Together, the friends built the Facebook, a site that lets users create profiles, upload photos, and interact with other users. Initially, the site was only available to Harvard students, something that they verified by requiring a harvard.edu email address. Another aspect the movie did not get right was how the Facebook got its first users, although it does come sort of close with the telling of FaceMash and how a few friends told some other friends and so on. Dustin Moskowitz, who was one of the four who developed Facebook with Mark, would later explain it. Quote, when Mark finished the site, he told a couple of friends. Then one of them suggested putting it on the Kirkland House online mailing list, which was about 300 people. By the end of the night, we were actively watching the registration process. Within 24 hours, we had somewhere between 1,200 and 1,500 registrants. End quote. While they don't really focus on this in the movie, if you look at the design of the Facebook, you can see an image of Jesse Eisenberg at the top in the banner. Did Mark Zuckerberg really put his image on the site? No, but there was an image of Al Pacino, and at the bottom of the site was the text, quote, a Mark Zuckerberg production, end quote. You can actually still see this thanks to the Internet Archive. I'll put a link to it in the show notes so you can see what the Facebook actually looked like. In April of 2004, Mark, Eduardo, and Dustin formed the Facebook as an LLC in Florida. For a while, they ran the site out of their dorm room in Harvard, Another character is introduced in the movie around this time when Justin Timberlake, who's playing Napster's founder Sean Parker, stumbles on the Facebook on his girlfriend's computer. This happened, although technically it wasn't his girlfriend. It was his roommate's girlfriend, and it's not likely Sean was sleeping with her like Justin Timberlake's version of Sean was in the movie. In fact, after the movie was released, Sean Parker had a few things to say about Justin's portrayal of him in the movie. Sean said of Justin's role, quote, it's a great performance of a character that isn't me, end quote. And then in another interview, Sean would say, quote, You know what? I was always a little puzzled by the social network because I kind of thought Jesse Eisenberg looked more like me than Mark. I don't think I look anything like Timberlake, but it's not so bad being played by a sex symbol, end quote. And let's face it, there's not much sexiness in the founding of Facebook, so Hollywood likes to throw some in here and there periodically. The core plot line to the movie remains the same. Sean Parker did find the Facebook on the computer of his roommate's girlfriend, who was a student at Stanford. By this time, the Facebook had expanded to be available to more than just Harvard. Sean reached out to Mark, but it was actually Eduardo who received the email. This kind of tells us that they likely had a shared email account as well as a shared bank account. In the movie, Sean takes Mark and Eduardo out to dinner at a very nice restaurant. It's here that Justin Timberlake delivers one of the most famous lines in the movie, as he says, a million dollars isn't cool, but a billion is. We don't know if that actual line is true, but the scene is. 
Sean was well known for being the guy or the kid behind the music sharing service Napster. So even though Napster didn't make it, thanks to being illegal and all, he had already done his fair share of raising money for his internet startup. So when Mark and Eduardo agreed to meet, Sean took them out to a high-end restaurant in New York called 66. While this wasn't mentioned in the movie, Sean didn't have much money, so this meeting ended up breaking the bank for him. In the movie, you'll see there's a girl sitting between Jesse Eisenberg and Andrew Garfield, and that's Eduardo's girlfriend, Christy Lee, played by Brenda Song in the movie. But in real life, the girl who went to the meeting with Mark, Eduardo, and Sean at 66 was Priscilla Chan. That was Mark Zuckerberg's girlfriend at the time. She and Mark would marry in 2012. Sean bolstered his relationship with Mark when he set up an interview with one of Sean's friends, Reed Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn. Reed ended up not investing on the grounds that the social network idea was too close to LinkedIn's, but instead he offered to set up a meeting with Peter Thiel, the co-founder of PayPal. Then, in June of 2004, the Facebook got a $500,000 investment from Peter Thiel. For his investment, Peter received 10.2% of Facebook. Today, 10.2% of Facebook is worth about $5.4 billion. This investment meant Mark could move out of their dorm room at Harvard. So, Mark decided to move to a house they rented in Silicon Valley out in Palo Alto, California. The investment also meant the Facebook was leaving Harvard. Still positive that Mark stole the idea from them, the Winklevoss twins sued. It was a lawsuit that would go on for years. While Mark and Dustin headed west with the Facebook.com, Eduardo went to New York to intern at the Lehman Brothers. That part of the movie was true. But the three kept in touch through Instant Messenger. Mark asked Eduardo to start setting up a company, getting funding, and build out a business model for the Facebook. This would be the beginning of the end for Mark and Eduardo's friendly relationship. Another I am exchange, this time between Mark and Eduardo, shows how life for Eduardo must have been quite different on the East Coast than Mark's in Silicon Valley. Eduardo, so you guys go out a lot to party ins and such there? Mark, in general, we don't do fun things, but that's okay because the business is fun. Eduardo, lol. Yeah, it is. No fun things though? Mark, eh, enough. No doubt he was working hard, but it's worth mentioning that it's not like Mark was locked away in his rented house working on the Facebook all the time. The social network shows that Sean Parker, once again played by Justin Timberlake in the movie, meets up with Mark shortly after he moves out to Palo Alto. This happened, but not the same way that it does in the movie, with Sean showing up at Mark's door. In reality, Mark and Sean happened to run into each other in Palo Alto, they didn't expect to meet, but when they did, Mark invited Sean to move into their house with them to help with the Facebook. When he did, Sean officially became the first president of the company. There's a scene in the movie where Sean and Mark are at a nightclub, and Justin Timberlake's version of Sean Parker suggests Mark make business cards that say, quote, I'm CEO, bitch, end quote. It seems far-fetched, but this actually happened. Well, well, we don't know if it was Sean's suggestion, but Mark Zuckerberg did have two cards. One simply said, CEO, and the other said, I'm CEO, bitch. Then again, this is the same Mark Zuckerberg who was a self-proclaimed programmer god back in his Synapse days. Things continue to sour between Mark and Eduardo, and in the movie, the souring appears to occur when Eduardo feels he's being squeezed out of the company unfairly by Mark. This, too, is an exaggeration in the movie. In truth, the relationship between Mark and Eduardo really started to sour when Mark found out Eduardo wasn't spending his time on the East Coast building funding for their company. The relationship was on thin ice, but that ice would soon break. Eduardo wasn't only avoiding what Mark considered the bare minimum commitment to their company, but he was developing a site of his own called jaboozle.com which was a site that allowed students to network with other students as well as companies. This site, which Eduardo built with five of his friends in New York, launched on February 4th, 2005. Then, Eduardo went one step further. He launched ads without Mark's permission on the Facebook, pointing to his new site. This email from Mark Zuckerberg to Eduardo shows how it was Mark who felt he was being betrayed. Quote, 
You developed Jaboozle knowing that at some point Facebook would probably want to do something with jobs. This was pretty surprising to us because you basically made something on the side that will end up competing with Facebook, and that's pretty bad by itself. But putting ads up on Facebook to advertise it, especially for free, is just mean, end quote. We don't know how Eduardo replied to that particular email, but we do know he did what he is portrayed as doing in the movie, freezing the shared bank account with Mark. Without financing, Mark had to turn to his family and they put in some loans to help keep the Facebook afloat. In the meantime, this was the last straw for Mark and he was determined to get rid of Eduardo. In an instant message to the third official co-founder of the company, Dustin, Mark said of the Brazilian Eduardo, quote, I maintain that he f himself. He was supposed to set up the company, get funding, and make a business model. He failed at all three. Now that I'm not going back to Harvard, I don't need to worry about getting beaten by Brazilian thugs, end quote. In the movie, this is where all of the legal battles begin. And in truth, there certainly were legal battles for ownership of the company. For his part, Eduardo didn't even realize what was happening until it was too late. It seems he was focused on his new website, Jaboozle, and wasn't really paying attention to the Facebook. History tells us he was focusing on the wrong site there. Wanting to distance himself from Eduardo, Mark turned to Sean to help him with the business side of things. And he had a suggestion. Again, going back to instant message records, we're able to get a peek into some of the ideas they bounced around. Sean, Peter Thiel tried some dirty tricks. All that shit does is like classic Moritz shit. Mark, haha, really? Sean, only Moritz does it way better. Mark, that's weak. Sean, I bet he learned that from Mike. Mark, well, now I learned it from him and I'll do it to Eduardo. So what dirty tricks was Mark going to pull? Well, a later IM exchange between Mark and an unknown friend gives us a little more insight. Friend, I'm not sure it's worth a potential lawsuit just to redistribute shares. You have nothing to gain. Mark, no, I do, because until I do this, I need to run everything by Eduardo. After this, I have control. That and history tells us what happened. Essentially, the company Mark and Eduardo were tied to was a Florida LLC. Mark created a new company in Delaware, and then that company would buy the Florida LLC, redistributing the new shares to everyone but Eduardo. Another email from Mark surfaced that gives us even further insight into what was happening. Quote, Eduardo is refusing to cooperate at all. We basically now need him to sign over intellectual property to a new company and just take the lawsuit. I'm just going to cut him out and then settle with him. And he'll get something, I'm sure, but he deserves something. He has to sign stuff for investments and he's lagging and I can't take the lag. End quote. In March of 2005, Viacom offered Mark $75 million for the Facebook like he did with the millions he was offered for his Synapse Winamp plugin, he turned it down. A month later, in April, Eduardo finally realized what was going on with the Facebook when he, along with other investors, was sent a letter out of formality asking for a second round of funding. Two weeks later, Eduardo's response came in the form of a letter from his lawyers. One day later, Mark officially fired Eduardo. We'll never really know how much Eduardo knew of what was going on. No doubt he'd signed paperwork here and there throughout his time with the Facebook. And in that paperwork, was there something that signed away his rights? We'll never know. Eduardo was on the East Coast. Mark was on the West Coast. But we do know the next part of the story was fought in the courtroom. In the movie, Mark is faced with two lawsuits at the same time. The original lawsuit from the Winklevoss twins and now one from his former partner, Eduardo Saverin. And in truth, Mark was pulled into multiple legal battles as the company was growing. On September 20th, 2005, the Facebook officially changed to Facebook.com when they bought the domain from a Canadian charity for people with facial disfiguration about face. The domain was purchased for $200,000. The movie focuses on a party thrown in honor of Facebook hitting its one millionth member. At the party, Sean Parker is caught with drugs. Now, the movie implies Mark was the one who called the cops on Sean in an attempt to get him kicked out of the company. This didn't really happen the way the movie makes it seem. Mark was not out to get Sean kicked out. 
But Sean did get arrested at a party in 2005, and the police did find cocaine there. Even though Sean was never charged, it was enough to make Facebook's investors cringe. They didn't want to be associated with Sean anymore, so he was forced out of the company. But even after leaving Facebook, Mark and Sean remained friends, with Sean resorting back to his unofficial advisor role. In fact, Mark would later say that, quote, Sean was pivotal in helping Facebook transform from a college project into a real company, end quote. It was Sean Parker who suggested cleaning up the interface and adding in photo sharing functionality. The movie ends with one of Mark's lawyers, who's played by Rashida Jones, letting Mark know that they're going to settle the case with Eduardo. The final scene in the movie wraps up the story quite nicely as Mark is sitting alone in a dark office, sending a friend request to Erica Albright. If you don't remember Erica, she was Rooney Mara's character, the girl who broke up with Mark in the first scene, so it's a nice little circle in the story. And again, the movie fictionalized the story to wrap things up, while throwing in just enough truth to make it seem real. But in truth, Mark was dating Priscilla Chan, and didn't try to get back together with Erica. But Erica Albright is a real person. In fact, as of recording this, the latest post on her website at ericaalbright.com is from 2011, when she asks if she'll always be known as Mark Zuckerberg's girlfriend. She claims she still talks to Mark on occasion and has met Mark's now wife, Priscilla. Erica's site says, quote, The movie, Social Network, really depicts me as being a bitch. Yeah, I know Mark wrote that in public HTML code, which is now totally public, but I'm not really a bitch. Do you want to know the real story about me, the ex-girlfriend of Mark Zuckerberg? Even though it is really cool that someone played me in a movie, I am completely the opposite of how I am depicted in the movie. End quote. So while the characterization of Erica may be completely incorrect, Mark did, however, settle with Eduardo. And he actually settled the other lawsuit with the Winklevoss twins, too. While a lot of documentation for the lawsuits was public, because the suits ended in private settlements, we don't really know a lot of what happened. In 2007, a Massachusetts judge called the allegations by the Winklevoss twins, quote, tissue thin, end quote. Judge Douglas P. Woodlock wrote, quote, dorm room chit chat does not make a contract, end quote. A year later, Facebook tried to get the case dismissed, but failed. Then a settlement was agreed on. In 2009, it was leaked that Mark's settlement with the Winklevoss twins was for $65 million, money that the twins, who were actually Olympic rowers as the movie mentioned, ended up investing a portion into Sum Zero. Sum Zero claims to be, quote, the world's largest community exclusively for professional investors, end quote, and is led by the twins' good friend in the movie, Divya Narendra. As for the other settlement, Mark Zuckerberg and Eduardo Saverin finally agreed on a 5% ownership stake in Facebook. Eduardo doesn't have any control in the company, but considering he had put in less than $50,000 early on, his investment earned plenty back. 5% of Facebook today is worth about $2.7 billion. And the rest, as they say, is history. After the events depicted in the movie, Facebook would continue to grow. In 2006, Yahoo offered to buy Facebook for $1 billion. It was rejected. Then Microsoft finally got to own a part of a Mark Zuckerberg-owned project, Although he had turned down their offer to buy Synapse so many years before, in 2007, Microsoft bought a 1.4% stake in Facebook. In 2008, Facebook hit 100 million active users. Then they overtook MySpace in 2009 to become the world's largest social network. Facebook continued to grow as it added games such as Farmville and Mafia Wars in 2010. At the end of 2010, of course, the social network came out. A year after the movie was released, perhaps somewhat ironically, a group of investors that included Justin Timberlake would end up buying Facebook's major competitor, MySpace. Did playing in the movie about Facebook convince Justin to get in on the social network action? We'll likely never know. On February 1st, 2012, Facebook officially went public. Today, the company that started off in room H33 of Harvard University's Kirkland House is valued at over $50 billion.
This episode of Based on a True Story was written and produced by me, Dan Lefebvre. Clearly, and by admission of the movie's writer Aaron Sorkin, The Social Network really isn't a true story. There's definitely elements of truth, but just enough to tell a good story, even if it's not a true one. If you want to dig into the true story behind the rise of Facebook, I'd really recommend The Facebook Effect by David Kirkpatrick. Although the movie didn't get any input from Mark Zuckerberg, the Winklevoss twins, or anyone really involved in the actual rise of Facebook, David spent many years researching and interviewing the people who were there to piece together what actually happened. If you've heard this show before, you'll know that this is the part where I usually mention my Twitter handle, but it seems kind of odd to mention Twitter in an episode about Facebook. And since most of the internet-connected world is on Facebook these days, I'm going to jump to the conclusion that you are as well. So I've set up a Based on a True Story page on Facebook as well. Stop by, like the page, and let's be friends. Links to that, credits for the show, and show transcripts can all be found on the show's website at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. Lastly, if you want to support the show, you can check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash basedonatruestorypodcast. Thanks for listening. <laughs>